Fill us in, and I've, I've, I've not asked you a whole lot of questions about the annual report, mm -hmm. and that was really why I came here, and it's been so interesting. I haven't, I haven't asked you that. Fill us in on the nuts and bolts of that report and the things that you're most proud of and the things that are the most challenging. Well, I think CARE made a lot of progress in 2015, despite some of the hurdles that we're facing. You know, we, had, uh, we, we have the annual conference, and the annual conference was held in New Orleans in 2015. It was a blockbuster success. People said, best conference I've, I've attended since the program started. The whole thrust, and I learned this at the very first CARE conference that we organized down in Destin, Florida, is people come there for the networking opportunities. Uh, we try to have good, robust speakers that deliver valuable information, but we try to build a lot of time into that conference so people can network. A lot of business done at the conference, so, so we had a good success there. CARE put up a new website, uh, been very well received, much more robust than what we had. Our old site was well over a decade old and was not current with modern technology. We've made some pretty significant advances in our program in California in terms of staffing, our reporting that we're doing. One of the things I didn't mention that's been, I think, enormously helpful to the recycling community that participates in the California program is we used to get quarterly reports and distribute the subsidy payments quarterly. We've now moved to monthly reporting, monthly, monthly subsidy payments, which has been an enormous positive impact for the recycling community that participates in that program from a cash flow point of view. A lot of work went into doing that. You can imagine, we get thousands and thousands of pieces of data every month, and it takes a lot of effort to put them in a form that you can make sense out of, validate that the data is accurate and truthful, and then get the checks issued in a timely fashion to our recyclers. And we do the same thing for the Voluntary Product Stewardship Program, and again, that one's still on a quarterly basis. So. Your, your listeners can go to the website, download the report. You could see a lot of charts that very easily put into perspective what we've accomplished mm -hmm. over the year. I mentioned the 494 million pounds collected in 2014. I would highlight the fact that <clears throat> from the early days of CARE, I always felt that CARE was undercounting. We tried to be conservative on purpose. We didn't want anybody to say we're cooking the books. So we were very conservative. But I always felt we were undercounting. In late 2013, working with Dr. Matthew Ralph of Georgia Tech, who's been one of the great resources for this industry and for care over the years, he and I sat down and we worked up an approach called mass balance. And it changes the way we collect data and analyze data, and I believe the data is much more accurate today. Uh, the result of this was we learned when we asked recyclers to give us data, we say, how much carpet did you collect or how much did you bring in? They were guessing. They were guessing because there's no value in taking time to weigh and record and the expense of doing that. But they know precisely to the pound every pound that gets shipped out because they're either getting paid for it or they're paying to have it handled mm -hmm. by a cement kiln or waste energy. So what we did was we switched to this mass balance approach and we said, we're going to ask for all the outputs across all the channels that it can go out, including international shipments. We're going to add all that up and we're going to say, how much did you have to bring in if you shipped all that out. And, it, it, and, and if people look at the charts, you see a big jump in the bar chart from 2012 to 2013. And that's because I think we have a much more accurate assessment of what's being collected and shipped and sold around the U.S. So I think that was a very big accomplishment for us uh, last year. And those details are in the annual report. Give us, give us the website while you get at this point. I'm going to ask you again at the end, but give us sure. the word. In case somebody's listening and they can... They can follow you. Absolutely. On it's www.carpetrecovery.org. Okay. And then I think that, you know, we break it down in terms of where does all this stuff go. And I would tell you that of all that carpet, that 494 million pounds we collected, about 40, 40%, 45% goes to uh, the landfill. So it comes in, it gets sorted. Some of it goes directly back to the landfill. Some of it gets processed and the residual waste from that processing also goes to the landfill. landfill. So about 45%. I mentioned earlier 23% goes to recycling, and I, I talked about that. About another 23% goes to cement kilns, which is actually a good outlet because there's a lot of energy embodied in that carpet, plus 
all the calcium carbonate in the back of the carpet becomes part of Portland cement. So it's 100% used at that point in time. And about 8% is going to waste energy. So we made a lot of progress there. And I think I mentioned earlier that about 50% or so of everything that gets recycled actually goes into engineering thermoplastic applications. An example of that for your listeners is you lift up the hood of your car, you see all these black molded parts, air cleaner housings, battery covers, you know, radiator tanks, that's, that's the kind of application. High-end high applications. Mm -hmm. Waste to energy. You had mentioned earlier that there's a whole group of people that seem to think that's a really bad idea. But it would seem to me, you had pointed out, that you know, it is a valuable resource, basically. And it also keeps the machine going, it would seem to me. You have, it's not backing up in in uh, warehouses and it causes the collectors to want to collect more of this stuff, that would seem to be a strong argument. Well, I think it is. And um, I would suggest maybe when the readers go to the website, they might consider downloading Carpet Recycling 101 just to get an idea of what's involved. When a trailer comes into a recycling center and dumps all this carpet on the floor, it's a manual process where somebody has to touch each piece of carpet use an $18,000 electronic piece of equipment to identify what the face fiber is to determine whether that one's useful or not and mm -hmm. which pile it goes into for recovery. But when that load comes off, you can imagine there's probably five, six, eight, ten percent trash. People throw plastic buckets, they throw tack strips, hammers. We found dead animals, piano keyboards, car bumpers. All that has to get handled and that adds no value to the recycler. And then uh, there's a lot of trim. You put a new carpet in, there's little pieces that get trimmed. Those are too small, not efficient to handle each one, identify and say it's this fiber type. So those get thrown into the waste pile. So now you get a waste pile that represents some percentage of your flow in. What are you going to do with that? You either have to pay to send it to the landfill or if you could recover some value from the energy that's embodied in it or if you go to a cement kiln, recover the value for the not only the energy but the calcium carbonate. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a win-win for society. And these facilities that, that convert it this way, they're under strict environmental air permitting regulations. Mm -hmm. Their profile's no different than if they burn coal or gas or some other material in there that's going to be strip mined out of the earth. So I see a win on many levels for allowing this to be an acceptable yeah. manifold for some portion of the flow. How available is waste to energy if, if somebody here in Atlanta or some other place wanted to do that? Are there areas, are there, are there those people that will allow you to do that? There are waste to energy permitted facilities around the U.S. Their standard business model is we get paid to take in by the ton. It's been said they don't particularly like carpet because a ton of carpet burns slower and with higher heat value than other materials, which means less tons across the scale. But if you're willing to pay them, they'll take it. Uh, cement kilns, on the other hand, you know, they consume massive quantities of energy in the form of coal or natural gas or alternative fuel materials. Carpet is a drop in the bucket compared to their total energy needs, so it's relatively easy to blend it in. Waste energy facilities all over the U.S., you want to pay them for it, they'll be happy to take it. Cement kilns have to go through a separate permitting process to have carpet qualified as, a, as an acceptable fuel, so it's, it's a little more difficult to do that. There's, How about the availability, though? Well, there's plenty of cement kilns around the U.S. Uh, the availability of those kilns to have certified carpet as an alternate fuel, not too many of them at this point in time. But I may have mentioned earlier in this discussion that I was on the phone this morning talking about work that CARE has going on to try to get carpet designated as a non-hazardous yeah. secondary fuel material under the rules of the EPA. If we can get that designation, make it much easier for cement kilns to use this as an alternative fuel. The technology to process carpet when it comes in. I can remember having a conversation maybe a couple of years ago about the ability to strip more of the face fiber off the backing. Whatever happened to that, and is that improving? And I guess there's not a lot of incentive to come up with new, you know, new technology now. Right. But what's, you know, what's been happening there? Well, I think you're referring to shearing, kind of yeah. like they shear the wool off a sheep. Yeah. So there's been a lot of equipment development over the years. They've actually made some pretty good improvements in terms of the yield of that material. Um, and you get a relatively clean stream. So somebody would think if you just shave the top off, that's really clean fiber. 
Well, if you're going to go into a high-end application, it's still pretty dirty. It's a lot of par particulate, dirt particulate and, and contaminants associated with that. So it still has to go through some pretty rigorous cleaning steps. But people have made progress. For a while, everybody thought the answer was shearing, and shearing went up in the marketplace. And at one point in time, we had between two and three dozen shearing machines operational in the United States. And then as the economics of shearing began to be realized, people learn what works and what doesn't work, it came back down. We probably have a dozen shearing machines operating around the U.S., give or take a few right now. The people that are doing them have, had to, have figured out how to improve the efficiencies, and they tend to be going into the higher-end markets. I see. Are there new technologies out there that are on the cusp of being launched? Yeah, I think number one, we mentioned Shaw Ringgold. That's brand new technology, never been practiced before. They're trying to bring that online right now. Um, there is a company out in California that has, I believe they've made the decision to make the investment in processing post-consumer carpet in California using uh, new technology, um, technology that provides a much cleaner environment from an industrial hygiene point of view and using a separation technology at the back end that gives you a really pure fiber stream. You know, low ash, less than 1%, virtually no polypropylene contamination, assuming you're talking about a, polyprop a polyester or a nylon stream that you're trying to produce. So, yeah, we do have some new technologies that our people are looking at. I know there's another one, probably I don't want to mention the name, that has brand new redeveloped technology that looks like it's also going to deliver a very high value product out there. Decision was been made and the investment has been made to bring that online. We do have some new products in particular. Um, you're talking to, you, you've heard from a company called Fiberon that has developed patented technology to compression mold deck boards made out of 100% post-consumer uh, polyester carpet. We have some folks working on stepping stones going into other outlets. So, you know, if it wasn't for the economics right now, we, we would probably be cracking the bottles of champagne and, and our real barrier is the economics that, that allow us to compete effectively in the marketplace right now. I got you. We have lots of people watching us and listening to us now. Watching you, they're not watching me. Um, what can they do to help the cause? Is there anything that they, they can do? And again, we've got retailers, distributors, manufacturers, and lots of other industry players. Right, so you have such a broad spectrum of stakeholders, you know, what, what's applicable for one may or may not be applicable to another. So I think right off the top what I'd say is it's a great time to invest in the future. Oil may be down today, but it's not always going to be down. The strong typically survive these down cycles, and when they do, they see strategic investment opportunities to put new technology capacity into place that makes them more competitive in the future. So I think that's, that's one area to look at. I think we have to ask our state and environmental NGOs to think about how can we work together instead of throwing stones at each other? How can we work together to create uh, procurement opportunities? incentives for these new products to go out into the marketplace. Um, take the time to get educated on how truly difficult it is technologically to, to collect, sort, process a carpet, and getting it in a form that's clean enough that can actually add value in the marketplace. And, um, and, and when they go buy carpet at retail, look at buying fiber pad as the underlay because a fiber pad is made from 100% post-consumer carpet. Today, a lot of fiber, a lot of pad that goes under carpet is rebond foam. It's that multicolored little pieces that are all glued together. At least 30% of that foam is imported waste from outside the United States. If we just displaced 10% of that with fiber pad, we could have a big impact on the amount of post-consumer carpet that's getting used in the marketplace today. Be a, be a big positive step forward. In terms of talking to various um, political bodies around the country. It wouldn't be a bad idea for all the people listening to us to talk to their state representative or people that they know that are in the procurement or rep representatives to take some action. And I guess that's what's really needed to move this thing forward, isn't it? Right. At the end of the day, no matter what we do on the front end, if people aren't willing to buy it, there's no reason to make it. If there's no reason to make it, there's no reason to collect it. You know, when it reaches the end of life, just keep sending it to the landfill. So you're right. 
you have to have demand for the product in the marketplace. And, and if we could tear down those silos and get folks talking to one another and appreciate what it means to close the loop, people are talking about the circular economy now. That's the latest sort of thing about understanding what environmental stewardship is all about. There are big opportunities there, but it requires energy and a commitment to listen and, and have dialogue. It seems like the whole awareness to recycling in general, I suspect more people are recycling everything, taking action in some, something like this seems to be more difficult than it should be. Probably true, and you know, it's, it's one thing for somebody to finish a water bottle, which an individual can handle and drop in a receptacle or walk over to, if they're at a ballpark, drop it into a receptacle. It's quite a different thing to sling a mattress on your shoulder or to take a six-foot roll of carpet, put it on your shoulder, take it out of your car and drive it to a place to recycle. So, so there, there is an element of ease for the public that, you know, that we have to figure out how to solve for them. And working with the retail community, every installer that installs new carpet, 80, 85% of the time when they install that new carpet, they're tearing out old carpet. Okay? When they bring that back, they've got to do something with it. You know, instead of driving it to the landfill, if we could get, make it easier for them to put it in a collection site that gets picked up periodically, or make it easier for them to stop by a recycler on the way and just drop it on their tipping floor, that's a win-win for everybody. Well, I guess there's opportunities there. We just have to make people more aware of it, I guess. Well, I will, I will tell you that CARE is working hard on this. And, and the carpet industry just had a big meeting this week talking about, uh, among all the challenges that they face, where does sustainability fit in this? And what can the industry be doing more to support solving these problems? They recognize how difficult it is, and they're asking the question, what can we do differently than what we're doing today to, to try to tackle these problems? Very so, good. Very a lot good. of energy. Well, it seems like you're, you've got uh, the engine running here and are charging forward, and I guess good things are going to happen as a result of that. Yeah, we got a few speed bumps in front of us, but, you know, we, we, we just had to keep plowing ahead. Very good. Well, you're doing a good job, and I really appreciate you spending some time with us this morning. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Dave, and, and, and Happy New Year again to all your listeners. So, well, thank you, and Happy New Year to you. And we've been talking with Bob Peoples. He, exec he is Executive Director of CARE, the Carpet America Recovery Effort, and this is Top Floor TV.